Welcome to another episode of Stratos Founder Journeys podcast. Um, I'm Daniel Scrivener. I'm joined by Rennick, who's the founding partner of Stratos, as well as Tucker, who's the CEO of Quo. Um, and today we're going to dive into what Tucker and his team have been building, which is basically a seamless all-in-one experience for anyone to be able to save up for a home and then be able to purchase a home um, all in one go, which is pretty revolutionary. Um, Rennick, Tucker, thank you so much for joining me. Good to be here. Thanks, Tucker. Tucker, I'd love to start just by talking about the origin story of Quo. And I think what I would be curious to dig into there is um, how you landed on the idea of building a vertically integrated kind of saving home buying experience, because that's very unique. And then two, if, the, you know, what the iterations were to get there and, and uh, if it was kind of a linear path, circuitous, but walk us through what that looked like. Yeah, definitely. So uh, definitely not a, a linear path, um, something that that kind of evolved over you know, the course of many years. Um, and, and for me, you know, the you know, taking all the way back to, to starting Quo, um, that was about three, three years ago now. Um, and it started when I met my co-founder, Neil, uh, who was working at N26, which is a really big uh, fintech company over in Europe. Um, he was doing some amazing work for them, uh, you know, building lots of cool anti-money laundering detection tools and that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, for me, it was kind of this wake up call to, hey, let's take all of these really awesome you know, computer science and product skills that we have and apply them to, you know, a, a mission that we care a lot about, which is can we make building wealth more more equitable? And that took us down this this really deep rabbit hole of, you know, what can we actually, you know, affect change in? You know, what is actually the, the biggest areas of that inequity and how can we uh, solve them? And initially we started off, you know, jumping straight into, you know, how can we do this just with a credit? You know, broadly, like how can we help people with credit? We saw this huge area where people were having problems, you know, figuring out what to do next, how to actually improve their credit, all of these different things. And so we built out uh, a kind of a different product than what Quo is today, nothing related to home ownership. Um, it was a personal financial management tool that allowed you to also get personal loans at a really low cost. And that tool was was really fun, great to build, uh, took a long time to build because uh, credit is really hard. Um, but it also taught us a lot about why people were actually improving their credit. Uh, and that was kind of that, the the origin for us jumping into home ownership was that almost all of our users were actually utilizing the personal financial management tools and the actual credit building building functionality to try and become homeowners. Like that was their ultimate financial goal, um, which it is for, for many, many people. And what we realized is that we could take all of those amazing personal financial management tools um, and combine them with, you know, a traditional mortgage lender uh, to create, you know, this kind of full vertically integrated product that you described, Daniel, right? Where we actually can help you figure out here's where you are today. Here's exactly what you need to do to become a homeowner and the best way for you to do it using your real finances. Um, and then once you're ready to, uh, to go, actually help you buy that house. Um, and so that kind of full stack, it did not start there, of course. It started off as something totally different. Yeah, that's always how it is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and and we invested. Um, you know, we met and invested uh, when it was still the, you know, consumer facing short term credit product before it was mm -hmm. you know transitioned. I remember when you told me about um, acquiring the the mortgage brokerage. So um, I think it'd be fun to get into that history a little bit, but. Um, you know, I think one thing that would be interesting to talk about is why do we think that this problem exists? Why is it so difficult for the average person to save for a home or become a homeowner? I kind of, you know, told part of the story there, just that saving is, is tough. But yeah, you've obviously, you, you got to this point by observing the behavior of your users. So obviously you're in a great position to kind of explain why this exists. Absolutely. I think, you know, the, there's a bunch of things that we've seen there uh, about like why it's hard. Um, and a, a lot of it, you know, ultimately kind of distills down to the fact that it's a very opaque and complex process and the, the guidelines are, are not clear. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you go out and look at, you know, like the mortgage you know, industry, there is hundreds of different loan products offered by dozens of different providers, uh, all with different criteria about how you can actually get access to those products and what that means for your ability to actually afford a home. And basically, nobody knows all of those products, right? Even if you go to like a mortgage loan officer, who is like theoretically is supposed to, like, they actually don't know all of the criteria that it takes to to get into, you know, different buying power for being able to purchase different types of homes. 
And we've seen that that kind of cascades into all these issues, including, you know, issues around saving. Um, and one of the ones that we saw among our users around saving specifically uh, was that people just didn't know how much they needed to save, right? There was no distinct goal. It was just, there's some big number in their mind of I need to save, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, <laughs> and it feels so unachievable. And that becomes this big barrier to actually getting started and actually putting, you know, the first dollar into the bank account. Um, and the same thing goes across credit, you know, across debt, across all of these different kind of financial vectors that add up to, you know, how much home can I afford? Do you think that there's... Um any macro story there in terms of just home prices increasing and just, you know, the actual quantum of capital required for a down payment? Um, yes and no. Uh, I definitely think that obviously home prices are, are going up. I mean, in, in huge numbers over the last few years, especially through, through the COVID pandemic. Um, but at the same time, I think that, you know, what we've seen is that, there is a huge amount of assistance out there, a huge amount of loan, you know, custom loan programs out there uh, that can help people afford much more than they assume, um, at lower payments than they assume, and be able to become homeowners faster. Um, for example, you know, just to, to throw one out there, uh, uh, the Federal Housing Administration is doing a program today where they will basically cover your entire down payment and closing costs on a 3.5% down loan. Um, wow. That is, you know, up to the standard FHA limit of about four hundred thirty thousand dollars, which is actually above the average price of a home in the U.S. today. Right? That means basically zero dollars down, you can buy a home at a, you know, not necessarily a crazy payment because they actually are covering real down payment amounts. So there is real options out there for people, and I think that that is also probably what has helped push up some of those home prices. Right? As government agencies roll out more of these programs, brings more capital into the system, obviously drives up uh, demand, drives up prices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd that's really to, interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. I'd love to talk a little bit about the saving experience in, in Quo and how that's different than, you know, there are many automated savings products that are kind of generic in terms of what you're saving for that are on the market. There's things like Digit, there's things like Chime, there's, you know, other things. Um, and then there's also just a savings account at a bank. What is different about what you built? And I think what would be interesting if you could try to weave it in is, I know obviously there's two inputs to buying a home. One is you're going to need some form of, you know, some amount of savings that you can basically put towards the home. And then there's the credit piece. So talk about how both of those show up in the product and how you're helping people learn, understand, get better at both of those. Absolutely. So that is, you know, was one of the really powerful things uh, that clicked for us when we, you know, decided to, to focus on, on home ownership was actually... Uh, the savings component and how having that focused goal of you want to buy a house really changes how you can think about savings. Um, so as you mentioned, Daniel, there's the, those two things, right? There's your, your assets, your savings and, and your credit, how much you can actually get for a loan. Um, and those things are actually very intertwined uh, much more deeply than just, Hey, I'm going to put 10% down and then get 90% of the mortgage. Um, the, so that has helped us create some really powerful tools for information. Um, so, for example, you know, the we connect to our users' credit reports, and so we can actually pull in. You know, Daniel, you have this five hundred dollar per month car loan, a thousand dollars towards student loans, whatever it is, and we can then actually make this determination of here is how much uh, you should be saving, but here is actually how much you should also be taking from that savings and putting towards debt instead. Hmm. And that's because those two, like again, those two things are intertwined. And if we can look at things like your debt to income ratios. What is actually going to give you the most leverage and help you get to being a homeowner faster uh, is utilizing, you know, that goal of having a home allows us to be much more effective in actually figuring out what's that right path for you. Yeah, that's amazing because also, you know, that's the, to your point, I, I've always thought of that technology's goal is to kind of help people be superhuman or be able to do things that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And, and that, you know, piece I would guess that 99% of your customers did, wouldn't have any clue how much to put down towards existing debt versus how much to save. So it's super powerful that you guys built that into the product. That's a core piece. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the actual, you know, the that split too is, is important because sometimes it goes the other way where we see users who are paying off debt that they really shouldn't. It's that, hmm. you know, the monthly payment is not going to be impactful to their debt to income. Um, instead, yeah. they should just be putting that into a savings account. So it, it you know, it cuts, it cuts in both directions. Yeah, it really ends up being a, a vertically integrated financial, you know, personal financial tool, which is really helpful. And I mean, it would otherwise require just so much research and, and 
existing knowledge to, to understand that it's, it's so valuable. But then, you know, as I alluded to earlier with the, the, the brokerage component, now you're able to handle the entire timeline of from saving to actually closing on a home, which is really awesome because, you know, it's a great experience for the user, but also you're starting much further upstream than pretty much any other mortgage lender. So it'd be really interesting just to hear how you guys came about that, where the idea came from, how that's working for you now. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, it, it was very serendipitous for us as we were basically in the process of, of you know, this consumer discovery and learning, you know, how we could really move the product towards home ownership. And, and at the same time, uh, we had a, a friend from uh, a previous uh, startup accelerator who had started a, a mortgage brokering uh, startup. Um, and they were called Uncapped Mortgage at the time. And they were really focused on, on a totally different segment of the market. Um, and unfortunately, they were looking for a soft landing, um, you know, for, for their team as they were kind of spinning down. And we realized, hey, we can bring these two things together in a very powerful way, like you were mentioning, Renick, right? Like we are able to actually combine a full lender with this like pre-experience um, and it unlocks some super interesting uh, superpowers uh, for our customers, as you're saying, Daniel, uh, as well as you know, business uh, for us, because it's obviously a huge amount of revenue when somebody goes and closes a mortgage. Um, and so that really you know is what got our wheels turning and saying hey if we actually have this brokerage that's going to be able to, to you know help people get that mortgage over the long tail we can you know now think about it as we're going to help somebody a year two years six years before they're ready to buy that house and it's almost like nurturing them and driving towards the shared goal of becoming a homeowner where we that's where we actually monetize right um, and that drives huge sales emissions to see for us. It means we could go to places that everybody is basically ignoring those customers, right? Places where they're throwing them away and saying, hey, this is an unqualified lead. They're not ready to buy a house. I don't really care about them. We can go and scoop those people up and drive huge sales efficiency for, for Quo. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about how other uh, mortgage lenders, you know, source their customers and what that looks like versus, you know, where, where Quo, Quo is sourcing your customers. Yeah, definitely. And, and here it's useful, I think, to, to kind of split the market, right? So there's there's kind of two different types uh, of, of lenders out there. There's kind of like the, the digital, you know, what I would say is like the, what has disrupted the mortgage industry so far. And that's places like, you know, better.com or, or Rocket Mortgage. And and those guys are, are very refinance focused and, and mostly acquire their customers online. Um, and so they're mostly running online ads, TV ads, obviously all those Super Bowl spots, right? <laughs> Everything like that, where they're really trying to go out and say, hey, we have super low rates, come in and, and use our, our products to get a uh, to get that great rate. And then there's the very traditional, you know, lenders um, and brokers out there who are really focused on uh, referral business or, you know, maybe traditional lead sources like uh, Zillow or UpCity um, that are very, very, you know, transaction oriented, but also very small. Um, even in a really big organization like Movement Mortgage, for example, they're separated out of these little branches and each branch is you know, in charge of their own user acquisition. And so they, those two share a very big, uh, big commonality of, you know, high customer acquisition costs. <laughs> um, for one of them, it's because, you know, for, for Rocket Mortgage and Better.com, it's because they are spending so much money in saturating these channels, you know, Google Ads and Super Bowl uh, spots. Uh, and for the small guys, it's because they don't have capital to deploy, you know, to, to scale out, right? Like they're, they're operating at a very small scale um, within their local communities, which works well uh, at, you know, for, at a small level, but it doesn't really blow up very well. Um, and so of course you don't see massive growth in those companies. Um, and for us, what we've seen is kind of this ability to, to split that difference where we are able to go, uh, you know, to, to digital channels like rocket and better, um, to acquire customers that, you know, who want to buy a house. And then you end up getting this huge amount of them who are not ready, right. You know, 60 plus percent of those leads that are coming from these digital channels are, are people who just are trying to figure out if they can buy a home and they can't yet. And we're able to then retain and engage them and drive way higher efficiency, way lower the long-term customer acquisition costs. But then on the local side, you know, we're also able to, to take those uh, strategies and, and scale them up, right? So one is really common is working with agents, right? Agents are kind of the central figure within any home purchase that these smaller, you know, movement mortgages and, um, are able to, to really focus on. 
And we can take this technology and say, hey, agents, you can use this with your clients. We can build more tools for you uh, to actually support those clients over the long tail, you know, de- before the purchase, during the purchase, after the purchase. Um, and so really, if, you know, for us, the way that we like to think about it is this kind of the, the older rock mortgage and better and that kind of thing. They use technology to disrupt the process and, you know, efficiency within the transaction. And we're trying to use that technology to disrupt distribution. It's a fascinating example. I, I was going to ask one more question, Tucker, which is I'd be curious to kind of change pace a little bit and, and z- talk a little bit more internally. And I think this is, I, I would love to explore this at like the company level, how this has changed operations, but also how it's changed your role of moving from owning a piece of the value chain to being vertically integrated. Because what I would guess mm-hmm. is well, as soon as you decide to become vertically integrated, complexity just shoots up. <laughs> the Probably the org and the, even the mission of, of the company completely changes. And I think it's a really interesting example because obviously companies go from not being, you know, kind of full stack vertically integrated to, to being so, but I've never heard anyone talk about what that transition is actually like. Can you like kind of take us in and talk to us about that transition? What was it like? Absolutely. Um, it, it definitely is not easy. Um, and I would say that there's, it changes at the kind of the, rather than like the mission level, which for us has always kind of stayed the same. And, and I feel like, you know, as a company, mission should change very, not very often, but vision definitely changes very, uh, you know, precipitously, where we went from thinking about ourselves as how can we really deliver information to customers at the right time and, and help them, you know, develop their finances and then monetize off of that to, you know, how can we actually guide this customer over the really long tail of their financial life, um, help them, you know, become better homeowners, utilize information smarter over time. Um, and that is is difficult to, to have a fundamental shift in vision. Um, it's kind of like, you know, steering a ship through a storm where you're figuring out what is the right you know, path here? What is the right way to, to actually make uh, the company successful and, you know, to rally the team on both sides, right? You know, we have this big operational side within the mortgage brokerage. We also have obviously our amazing product engineering teams that we need to bring together around that common vision. And I would say that's the hardest part, right? It's like, how do you form that uh, connection? Um, and it's something that we're still navigating. You know, I think it's not like a job that's ever done. You know, that's part of being a founder. <laughs> it's like, how do you constantly drive towards vision, constantly uh, keep your team rallied behind it? Um, so, you know, overall, I would say that the the verticalization definitely shifted our vision, definitely made us question many decisions within our product, made us throw out stuff that, you know, we maybe wouldn't have otherwise and add many new things. Um, but it also allows you to dream bigger. Like, I feel like that's kind of like the, the amazing part of verticalization is saying, rather than how do I focus on just this one piece and, and you know, expanding within that, how can I then take that and, and really parlay it into bigger and bigger and bigger gains for our customer, bigger and bigger gains for our business? Just last question on that, and then we'll move on. I know that you're still early in this, you know, transition, obviously, of kind of moving to this, you know, vertically integrated structure. Is there any ad- advice that you would have for other founders going through the same transition <laughs> or things you've <laughs> learned or been surprised by so far? Hmm. I would say, especially if you're, you know, looking at bringing on, especially, you know, building out new organizations and especially the organizations that look very different than what you have today, uh, focusing on that culture piece is, is critical. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something that, you know, uh, Neil and I, we, we had some thought towards, but not enough, right? Like, and, and I think that that is the, that is a failing that we had of, I mean, that we've had to kind of come back and, and really fix of like, how do we actually really integrate deeply the culture of of this very technology product focused team and this really operational sales focused team and, and bring those two together is is hard and it's something that i think a lot of founders especially early stage like you're not putting that much effort into and you have to put 10x more than you expect uh because you just think hey like this has been working great with this team like surely that'll just work for this new one um mm-hmm. and that is not the case yeah totally different team totally different culture very much so especially in an acquisition or anything like that Renick, do you want to take the next question? Yeah, so um, we'd love to hear a little bit more about just what the user experience has been so far. Um, I know you've had some some successes um, with some of your early users moving through the full pipeline. So, um, you know, what have those ex- experiences been like? Um, how have they reacted to what you built? 
Yeah, I mean, it's obviously the, the most rewarding part, <laughs> especially uh, when you get to get somebody all the way through through to home ownership and, and see them, you know, get those those keys and send us that picture. Um, that is a, a huge motivator <laughs> for us. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that experience that we've really seen is, you know, coming in, uh, being motivated to, to buy a home. Right. And I think that like that is kind of this uh, what, for the customers that have been the most successful, they have that innate motivation of, I want to be a homeowner and I'm going to, you know, do what it takes to, to do that. And then really searching for that plan. And that's when they find quote, right. And they're like, Oh, this is the thing that's actually going to tell me how to do that. Um, and so we had, a, you know, for example, a customer who came in, she was able to connect all of her finances and actually show, Hey, this is, you know, how much I need to save. This is exactly how much credit I need to build over the next few months. She was able to do that successfully and then um, be able to then transition over to, to the brokerage to quote home to actually close on her financing really quickly. Um, and she purchased a condo uh, just about a week ago. Um, and so able to really move through that entire process over the course of just, uh, I think it was about four months um, where she went from, I don't even know if I can buy a house to actually being a homeowner. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, have you had any you know, what was her feedback or do you have any other examples of feedback from users? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so her, her feedback of course was on, on the product side, being able to get that plan, be able to see exactly like what are the benchmarks I need to hit very, it was very motivating, right? Like that gives you a really strong place to, to go. Um, and I think that she also had negative feedback as well, which was that, you know, there was pieces of the user experience that were clunky. There was sometimes it was hard to understand you know, how, to actually navigate the transaction. Um, and, and that's something that we're really actively working on right now to, to fix because you know we saw through you know, her experience and others um, that when you're actually within the, the transaction itself, we're not providing enough transparency uh, when we could be, right? Like, where is my loan at? Where is it in underwriting? What are the conditions I need to clear? Um, and so we actually have, you know, because of feedback that we've gotten about that over the last few months, we've gone out and built our own point of sale system I was basically uh, ripping out, you know, all this pre-built things that we've used in the past and said, let's just rebuild how you actually apply and get a mortgage so that we can bring that transparency uh, to customers. So yeah, definitely uh, good feedback and, and bad, <laughs> but mm -hmm. always good things to learn from. Yeah. I mean, that process otherwise can be so opaque while you're, you know, mid underwriting. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, you know, quickly on that Tucker, um, well, one, thanks for sharing the negative feedback because I think it's it's that's obviously something as a founder, you're always getting positive and negative and you have to always be receptive to that. Um, I think what's interesting is, uh, you know, you guys have been very successful. Obviously, you're, you're approaching this as a product experience and trying to make it seamless. So I have no doubt you guys will solve this whole new piece and how to do it because in my experience, you know, of just going through the traditional loan underwriting process, it's, it's terrible. Technology has not made it into any part of, <laughs> of that. And no one's approached it as if they're designing a product or an experience. I want to talk really quickly um, about uh, a couple of, of things. So one in particular, you know, on, I, I think, so I want to zoom in a little bit and talk about the, the apps that you guys have built, because obviously this is app centric. So, so customers can download an iOS app. They can download an Android app. They're in, you know, they're basically um, say that that is the center of their experience as they're using Quo. And you guys have really focused on three pieces. One piece is around learning. And a lot of that shows up in the app. And that is how much of a down payment do you need? What's your credit score need to be? I think that's super interesting. There's also building, which is building savings and building credit. And then there's obviously closing, which is buying your, you know, buying the home. Talk about just how you guys have thought about the product experience of each of those and what's unique about your approach, given that you're app focused. Yeah, definitely. So, so starting, you know, on that place, right, with learning, you know, there we actually saw the most opportunity to, to be differentiated and unique. Uh, we didn't really see anybody who had gone out and taken real loan guidelines, real, you know, uh, underwriting guidelines to, to, people's real personal finances and actually giving you not just, you know, you need to save more, but here is this exact dollar about you, you really need to save, um, giving those precise targets. Um, that was a really key uh, experience that we wanted to build out because we saw how motivating that was for customers when they learned that. And that's something we started doing manually at the, at the very beginning, right? We just would go through and say, awesome, what's the best path? Like, let's sketch this out. And then does this work for those customers? Um, and, and of course, they, they were really excited to be able to, to get that motivation. Um, the second part of the learning is also making it really actionable. 
Uh, so rather than just saying, hey, you need to, to save this money and you need to build to this credit score and like just giving like high level goals, chunking it out and setting smaller milestones. So maybe you need to save $20,000 total to be able to purchase a home. But rather than showing you, hey, you need to save $20,000, we can break that out into these smaller milestones. Uh, after you save this first thousand, here's how much home you'll be able to afford. And after you raise your credit for five points, here's actually how that's gonna have an impact on your monthly payment. And being able to give these really you know, small wins that, to those customers over time uh, is really important. Coupled with that is of course, also try to hide a lot of complexity, right? And there is, because we're working with like these complex guidelines and underwriting and that kind of thing, it is really hard for us to communicate a lot of these interrelations. And, and I'll give you actually an example of where of, of we failed at that of the product experience and we're proving it is monthly payments. So monthly payments is this big factor that people care a lot about within their you know, housing payment, right? Like, I don't want to pay more than $1,500 a month uh, for my mortgage. Uh, and we had that built into the user experience where we could take that in as a preference. And we actually were using it to cap your buying power, right? Like if mm -hmm. this mortgage is going to make you pay more than that, it's going to bring your buying power down. But then what we saw was that people were, became very confused by it, right? Like they're like, well, I, why is my buying power not going up as fast as I would have expected? Or other calculators are telling me different things. And that's because there's this disjoint where we have to then teach this person about here's how monthly payments work. Here's actually how this is limiting you and why. Um, and that's, it's very difficult. And so, you know, definitely like a, a product experience that I think we have like put the most effort in and there's still a lot more work to do because it's very you know, critical to that customer journey. Mm -hmm. Um, Moving to closing though, right? So like after that customer's kind of, you know, started to, uh, or sorry, building, um, moving to building as that customer is actually like, they have those goals, they know what they're actually gonna do. And there we've kind of, we've actually tried a few different approaches. So we initially, you know, really were focused on what if we just brought all of these products um, seamlessly into, into the app, right? So we actually had savings accounts built out within the app itself where you could deposit money and build those savings over time. And what we realized is that that requires this big habit change um, of rather than just putting money into, you know, my, my current bank account or putting money through, you know, these other providers um, that I'm already using, I now have to switch that over to Quo. And what we saw was that that has not that much of a benefit to those customers, right? Like it, there is of course the benefit to us of like, hey, now we're able to haul in that money and maybe make interchange or whatever it is, but there's not a huge consumer benefit to like putting money in this savings account versus other savings account. And so we actually shifted, you know, with savings specifically over to uh, integrations, right? So using Plaid, check-ins and that kind of thing. And that's actually one of our most engaged with features is people coming in, updating those, making sure those balances are correct, um, reallocating if they, you know, uh, change things around. Um, and so, you know, going from this in-house to kind of this outsource was, was really big. And we've done the same thing across the other verticals as well. You know, there, there's income, there, uh, there's assets, there's credit and... Credit is obviously a really big one that we see, um, usually the second to, to savings of what's holding people back from buying a house. And there within building, you know, we focused on how can we find a really actionable items that we can give strong recommendations for and help you uh, actually take on. So uh, for example, credit builder loans uh, are these, you know, really, really awesome products that are great for some people. Uh, credit builder loan, you put money in, uh, you, you know, deposit of like $200 and then uh, or you take out the loan and you actually pay off, you pay it off and you don't get the money until the end, right? So it's basically very low risk for that bank and allows that person to build credit. But it's often advertised to everybody. <laughs> it's just like, hey, everybody should get a credit builder loan. But in, you really should uh, only uh, take one out if you have poor payment history, like in the last two years, right? And so we're able to do that analysis with your credit report and then actually give you recommendations. So, hey, here's some great credit builder loan companies that we actually work with that will you know, improve your score by this number of points um, and drive you again towards that goal. And so that outsourced approach has allowed us to, to move much faster, right? We've been able to add many more tools, been able to, to integrate much more compared to trying to bring everything in-house right away. Um, and for us over the long tail, we want to be able to bring those things in and build an even better experience around them. Again, being able to focus on home ownership, but uh, it allows us to drive more customer value when we're able to just provide the information and then help them build uh, through third parties. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of those first two phases, and then the closing uh, is you know been a a big challenge because that's the most regulated part of this, right? It's like the, the really hard part to dig into and say, hey, like 
let's redo how you might close on a loan. Um, but the customer journey there is also pretty easy to, to one up on, you know, the traditional process. Um, so for us, that was uh, focusing in on what are like the critical, you know, uh, documents and, you know, app, app pieces of the application that we can actually collect earlier um, mm -hmm. and then bring over, right? So as you're working with us in that learning and building phase, what are pieces of information that we can be collecting that is going to help us just get you through the closing process faster uh, once you actually get there and transfer that information over. And so that was one really critical kind of customer journey piece is that you know, our application time is about half of that of other people's because a lot of that information is built. Um, and then, you know, similarly is being able to build in integrations with things like Plaid, Argyle, right? Like all of these companies that are providing amazing financial data automatically that is just going to be correct rather than you flipping between different tabs on your phone of, hey, this is my bank account <laughs> balance, my account number and copying it over. Instead of just being able to gather that automatically, being able to have really simple and intuitive user experiences, um, clean interfaces, that kind of thing. Um, and so through that, you know, we feel like we built a really strong closing experience, um, but they have a lot more to do there. I think it, you know, the one area that we're really focused on is, you know, how do we start automating even more of that process on the back end so that you, there's less downtime for that customer and they can really fly through the process. Yeah. Yeah. You covered a lot of ground there. I just want to reiterate. I mean, I think <laughs> one, if you guys can make closing, uh, you know, basically take half as long or be twice as faster or whatever way you want to frame it. I think that's an incredible feat. But also, you know, I love just the idea of it. You know, when you paint that picture, it's very clear you guys are building a powerful home that somebody can use and they can just use this app really at the end of the day to be able to go all the way through that experience. I want to just talk about, I want to ask one follow-up question and then um, back over to, to you, Renick. And that's around, you know, when you talk about, um, the saving part of the experience, it does sound very daunting because for most, you know, and that's what I hear when you talk to people about saving for a home, I think for most people, it almost seems insurmountable. Like, how am I going to save, you know, for, for many people saving 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, these are very, very big, these are very big numbers. And, um, you know, I guess it almost maybe feels akin to weight loss where, you know, if you need to lose 50 pounds, it's, that seems very daunting and you have to get there a little bit by little bit. So you obviously break it down. Have you guys introduced other things into the app, like moments of excitement, milestones, like talk, talk just about how you're helping people stay focused on the goal and feel, feel that they're making progress one step at a time, even though it does take quite a while. Yeah, definitely. So obviously you mentioned, you know, uh, milestones and goals, which is obviously something that, uh, that, that we were doing by breaking it out into, you know, like those thousand dollar segments or even less for some consumers. Um, you know, one of the, the things that we have focused a lot on is how do you scale out the, those experiences, right? So for somebody who makes $200,000 a year, saving $1,000 as a milestone is, you know, maybe a little small. And so maybe that milestone needs to be two or $3,000. But for somebody who makes $50,000 a year, $1,000 could be a lot, right? Maybe their entire down payment is only $10,000. And so actually bringing that down to like two or $300 is, is the right milestone to set. And so scaling up and down those, those milestones and those goals is really important to be, you know, in proportion to that person's actual goal. Um, the other big thing that we have focused on is, is those, like you mentioned there, moments of excitement. Um, and for us, that's as you're actually saving, as you're actually putting that money in um, and you actually get uh, encouragement from us, right? So we do that in two big ways. First is obviously showing you your progress towards uh, home ownership. And the nice thing is, it's like with every $1 you save, it's basically, you know, like 20 plus dollars of, of home buying power. And so it makes it feel much bigger, right? So if I say you saved a thousand dollars, but now you can afford, you know, twenty thousand dollar more home, which is like an entire bedroom home, and you can draw those comparisons for people, it's much, much more exciting uh, than just saying, "Hey, you saved another thousand um, dollars." And, and of course, being able to then uh, to be able to drive that with you know rewards and kind of gamification, and that's something that we've also uh, you know worked into to that experience where we can actually say every time you come in and update your savings and letting us know how that progress is going, uh, we actually can give you you know uh, we call quo cash, which is like cash back you're going to get once you actually close with us. Um, and again, it's that uh, keeping you in that loop. So even if you're not you know move, making tons of progress week over week, you still feel like you're you're staying focused on the goal. Even if you, you know, move backwards, you're still getting something out of it and it still keeps it positive and keeps you on track. Yeah, super thoughtful. Yeah, that's great. I, uh, 
can imagine how um, working through that would just be so different than what currently, you know, there, there's really nothing else out there that is similar to that. And I think it's a, just shows just how much time you guys spent on just understanding the users and figuring out that journey and also iterating the product based on the feedback that you've gotten from people, um, which I think, you know, just really points to you guys uh, as, as founders and, you know, really helps us, uh, you know, build our conviction in, in you guys and supporting Quo. I'd love to ask a question around um, reviews. And we talked about this a little bit before, uh, but you guys have, you know, a bunch of incredible reviews on the homepage of your site. Um, and what I wanted to ask about there is just when we zoom way, way out, not just talk about the closing process, but what I want to talk about is just the feedback you're hearing in general, because I'm guessing, obviously, you know, so you guys are both trying to build a seamless experience. So you want the whole thing to be great. But you also have modules that people are going to be in for pretty long periods of time that are somewhat distinct. And, you know, so I imagine maybe you've even gotten feedback that, wow, this is a great way to save. This is so much better than other tools I've tried in the past. What generally have you heard from customers and, and what are they feeling like is different and better and great about Quo and what you built? Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I'd like that big general level, right? Rather than I'd like, you know, this feature or thing, you know, or whatever, uh, you know, help me towards this goal. At the general level, I think the what the feedback that we've really gotten is this makes it feel attainable, right? Like that is like the the biggest uh, obviously warms my heart, <laughs> but also like the biggest business goal for us is like we make that home ownership goal feel really attainable and something that you can actually you know, build towards. Um, and, and then once you, even if you're ready to buy that house, um, still making that feel attainable, right? Like that is, and I think that's something that a lot of mortgage companies lose sight of, of like, even that customer who's ready to buy today, mm -hmm. they still have many barriers to go through, right? There is still that big daunting process of finding a home, actually closing, getting through underwriting. That is not an easy thing. Um, and having simple, delightful user experience to kind of get through that process, even within the transaction, is super powerful. Mm -hmm. And providing information, keeping people, you know, in that loop, all of that is ultimately, you know, our specialty, right? Like our specialty is not being a mortgage lender or being a mobile app. It's how do we provide the right information, the right context, and a great user experience to our customers, um, and we believe that that's like how you change financial services and kind of cutting back to that mission. Like that's how you make building wealth more equitable because ultimately, you know, inequality and in information drives a, a lot of inequality within financial services to us, right? Like there is this, uh, there's lots of tribal knowledge. There's lots of information around, you know, financial education that is difficult uh, to, to obtain. Uh, and being able to surface that information in, in, that is really powerful uh, that is correct, <laughs> not just some BS you might find online. Um, that is, you know, really, really powerful to those customers. And again, contributes to that overall sense of, I can actually do this, right? I can get through this mm -hmm. process. I can find that home. I can build towards that home, um, kind of no matter what step they're in. Yeah. I mean, I love that. North. That's a really powerful North Star, just to say that, you know, the goal is to make home ownership feel more accessible for anyone. Because, it, you know, I think it's true. There really is not an alternative to that today, except wallowing in the sense that you're never going to be able to afford a home or never going to have a home. <laughs> um, I'd love to close it up by asking a couple of closing questions. Rennick, is there anything that comes to mind? Any questions you want to ask as we wrap up? Well, I, I think the, you know, one of the I, things that I've been, most impressed by just the whole quo journey is, you know, as I, I said this earlier, but really focusing on what you're learning from the users and, and moving the product in that direction. And mm -hmm. I guess, what would you say, you know, how did you continue to do that? Because I think a lot of times you have an idea and you want to go after it and you, you stick to that idea, even though sometimes maybe you know, the feedback you're getting is telling you maybe to move in a different direction. And so it can be really hard to kind of move with what feedback you're receiving. And I think you guys as founders have done a really good job of that. Um, and I'd be curious to know if you have any lessons or thoughts on that. Great question. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, and I think, you know, fundamentally, um, there's a question about failure, right? Like, at the end of the day, every product iteration is a, is a mini failure. Um, and failure is, is a good thing, right? It, like, that's where you learn. That's where you actually get the good stuff, like just praise and, and you know, all of that stuff is great and it's you know positive feedback can help, but real criticism, real failures is where you're able to, to find truths and actually, you know, see the reality and move through it. Um, I think that a lot of people are very afraid of failure. Um, even founders like who theoretically like shouldn't be like, I think those small failures can build up and, and it's an emotional burden at some level of going through the product cycle of like just constantly pulling from users, hearing what they're not liking. Um, People take that personally. Um, and I think the key for me and Neil has been to separate that out and say, this is not, you know, a personal attack on on our, our baby of, of you know, the, the app, but it's rather like us getting better and us actually being able to learn. And I think those are lessons that, you know, both Neil and I have pulled from previous life experiences. I was a, a competitive gymnast for about a decade. And, you know, that is something that like, I, I pulled from that experience of just, you're going to constantly fail, constantly strive for perfection, learn from every tiny mistake. Uh, and that's how you get better. Yeah. So well said. Well, you, yeah, that's awesome. You guys have done a, a really great job of that. Do you have any other advice for other founders on, on how to set themselves up to, you know, be able to uh, follow a similar journey? Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, the, the biggest one that I, in, a, in, in that vein of failure is that I think, um, I th you know, I think that a lot of people, like you said, get set on an idea and, and they start working on it and then they run into a snag and they say, ah, oh, this isn't going to work. And they, and they kind of throw it out and maybe start on something totally different or, or decide, you know, a startup is not right for them. Um, and, and I've seen this time and time again, especially, you know, going through through college and seeing lots of founders there and uh, afterwards and, you know, into starting quo and being in founder communities. Like there is, you know, I think people are kind of, uh, they often don't want to push through that pain and say, how do I actually just keep, keep inching forward? Um, and I think that that is a critical skill to, to finding huge, huge problems is being able to move through that pain and being okay with that. Um, and, mm -hmm. The problem with that is it's not flashy, right? It's <laughs> um, it's not it's, you know raising enormous rounds with you know three months back to back. It's not you know having billions of users right off the bat. It is how do I get that next person? How do I you know figure out what they want? Um, how do I be very methodical and thoughtful about what is like the market and the strategy that we're approaching and being okay changing that? Um, mm -hmm. That is really hard. Uh, so I would say you know. Basically, it's it's kind of cliche, but like you know, as founder, don't be afraid of failure. Um, but at the micro level, right? Like, don't don't throw uh, throw stuff out uh, too too easily. Be ready to kind of keep iterating, keep fo uh, focusing on what's next. Cool. Yeah. So well said. I want to yeah. ask one question just to close it out to kind of go all the way back to the beginning. You know, and you talked about that you know and so in this interview we've spent the entire time talking about where you've landed in terms of what you're focused on what your strategy is as a company and as you said it wasn't a linear journey to get there and i think that um you know so to go back to that for a second can is there any advice you learned in starting at place a not having any idea where b was <laughs> and navigating a bunch of different options to try to figure that out that you would pass on to other founders because one it's very common that wherever you start is not going to be the right place that you're going to end up. And two, it's also not talked about often enough, I think, of what are the tools and techniques and tactics and, you know, even just down to, um, you know, handling, like handling it emotionally of realizing that, oh, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. So uh, what high level advice would you have for other founders going through that? They're trying to zone in on exactly what they're focused on. Mm. This is going to be a, a little bit of a, a more like untraditional <laughs> bent on this, but I think, um, the Perfect. thing that helps uh, Neil and I the most is actually like building that emotional support system uh, to hmm. get through that because, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's a couple of different pieces, right? So like first is like, look outside of the industry. Um, I think if you are like staying all day on, on Twitter and TechCrunch and seeing, you know, like what is the best side of everybody, it's almost like that social media effect, uh, right? Of, of, you know, only seeing your friends having the most fun and you feel like everybody's having fun, <laughs> but you. Um, yeah. yeah. When you are in in that you know iteration phase, like that is 
uh, crushing, right? Like that is like emotional torture for yourself because you're like, why am I not experiencing this? Like everybody else mm -hmm. is, but me. And that's just not true. As you said, like it is very common. Um, you know, it's very common for people to go through, you know, the, the sludge to get there. Um, and so, you know, being able to tune out of that industry and having people that you are being frank with and saying, we're having, you know, these problems, we're actually working through it, uh, being able to talk it through with friends, even somebody who is not connected to tech or, uh, or your product space, like, you know, whether that's family members, whether that's former colleagues, whatever it is that's helpful for you, um, that is what kind of keeps you going over the long haul. Uh, you know, we were in that period of you know, really iterating for, for, you know, two years. That's a, that's a long, long time. time, especially, long time. <laughs> right? Like, especially within startups, that's a, that's, you know, infinite amount of time. Uh, and the only thing that was able for us to get through that was, you know, having amazing co-founder like Neil, where we were able to, to keep each other up, having, I mean, you know, an amazing family and community that I can lean on as we're kind of trying to figure this out. And of course, remembering, you know, just because we haven't figured it out yet doesn't mean you're a failure, right? Like you, you, yeah. you can keep going, you will get there. That's a, Yeah, I think so well said. I want to mm -hmm. take a little bit of a weird turn, Rinnick, and I, uh, you know, because this is something that also happens many times in many of our portfolio companies. And, and, you know, if you just zoom out of Stratos, if you're investing in companies, you're investing in teams and those teams are pursuing opportunities and those change and evolve and you have to, you know, navigate that. Rinnick, do you have any, you know, thing to share in terms of uh, what you've learned in terms of being hands off and letting founders go and explore in order to find that perfect fit in that, you know, like snap into place business model moment. Yeah, I think that um, in this case, even from early conversations that I'd had with Tucker, it was clear that he and the rest of the team were really thinking about what they were building from a very customer user focused perspective. And so when you have that uh, approach, I think it, from my perspective as an investor, it gave me conviction that they're going to keep iterating on that and find the thing that really addressed the need of the user. Mm -hmm. And so that made me confident that Tucker and, and Neil and the rest of the team were going to be able to follow that, those breadcrumbs, so to speak, as they have to get to where they are today. Um, and I think, you know, there was, we had many conversations about the early product, which was, okay, we're going to do these small consumer loans. And, you know, this is how we're going to, th this is what the unit economics are. And then there was a discussion about, well, what if we don't charge interest? And then, well, what if we don't do them at all? And we're just charging for the, you know, for the app. And so there was, a, I, I knew at that point that there was that, that Tucker and Neil were open to really pushing on that, those assumptions to try mm -hmm. and get to the right place. Um, and I thought, you know, that to me really stood out at, about them as founders and gave me a lot of conviction. And I, I think that's a unique skill. And, and that's why I asked the question. I think, you know, if more founders could learn from that approach, I think it would be really helpful. Yeah. I think it's really well said. And that's obviously huge credit to you, Tucker and Daniil <laughs> for being able to push through that two year, I'm sure, you know, soul crushingly painful process to try to figure out what that, you know, business model that, that felt like it was going to snap into place was going to be. Thank you so much for the time, Tucker. Thank you, Rennick. Um, for everyone listening, you know, to learn more about Quo, you can visit Quo.com. Um, you can also just download the iOS or Android app. It's beautifully designed, works great. Hopefully what we've covered here has made, uh, you know, everyone listening interested in, in checking it out. Um, we're glad to be investors. Thank you so much for joining us on Founder Journeys, Tucker. Appreciate it.